what we can learn today as to where we are in our progress towards addressing viral hepatitis in India. Let me start with um, Dr. Paul. So with um, about 26 million, 25, 26 million birth cohort, um, we have an opportunity to address every single one of those children, newborns, protecting them right at birth from contracting hepatitis B, whether from the mother or subsequently down the line. Where are we with this opportunity and how are we um, progressing, given your own background as a pediatrician and also engagement with um, the broader aspects of the country's health at the Niti Aayog? Well, I think this is a, a question which uh, can be provided more, uh, better answer from Manoj Jalani. But let me uh, set the stage by making a very, very, very fundamental uh, point with regard to the lack of awareness of, uh, of liver-related issues. I want to be brief, but I want us to appreciate that the time has come then for the entire gamut of liver diseases, of which hepatitis viral infections are at least one third to half of the burden, we must mount a huge primary healthcare response. I just want to tell you that chronic liver disease has entered the first 10 top causes of mortality in our country. And I think uh, uh, you may be astounded if I uh, share with you the numbers. Uh, uh, there are, in terms of deaths, for example, chronic liver disease is responsible for 2,18,000 deaths, and diabetes is 2,55,000 deaths, and kidney disease is 2,23,000. You hear so much about diabetes. Uh, if you compare with breast cancer, 80,000 comparatively. You know, you, it's not fair to compare diseases because each one of them must be eliminated. The point I want to make is the, the, the appreciation of the burden of disease, the ill health due to liver diseases is not on the radar screen of academics, policy makers, and the people at large. And therein lies the fact that the most important preventable part, absolutely doable preventable part, is to be able to address hepatitis B and to be able to address you now hepatitis C in a very significant way, which of course is part of that chronic liver disease that I'm referring to, to you. So the point that I like to make uh, is truly the fact that please appreciate the importance of viral hepatitis. Uh, please, there are ways to eliminate this, the ways to control it. Time has come that we see this as a part of the larger liver disease agenda for which the way forward is primary health care because through that, A, we can prevent because these hepatitis infections can be prevented. The alcohol-related liver injury can be prevented, fat-related injury can be prevented, and then, if it cannot be prevented, secondary prevention, like the way we are doing it for diabetes and hypertension, must be mounted. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Jalani, Dr. Paul very neatly lobbed off that question to you, saying that you're better placed to answer this. A year ago, um, we saw the launch of the National Viral Hepatitis um, Plan, and within that framework, and also with your larger role with the National Health Mission, where do you see the question that he's also raising that it needs to be part of the primary health care framework? Where do you see both these things coming together and how do we address, one, the prevention part of hepatitis B, um, the transmissible part of hepatitis C, and the treatment part of hepatitis C? How do you reconcile all these three things together? Yeah, so let me first say that India has now probably the largest program for control and management of viral hepatitis. Actually, uh, in the overall uh, general euphoria of Ayushman Bharat, this huge program, which is going to touch nearly 5 crore people suffering from hepatitis B and C, it did not receive the kind of limelight because there was so much discussion around Ayushman Bharat. But uh, I must, I can proudly say that we introduced uh, exactly one year ago, we rolled out this National Viral Hepatitis Control Program. And uh, it, is, it is very well conceived with inputs from all the necessary experts. And uh, we are committed to eliminating Hep C by certainly by 2030 and significant reduction in terms of mortality and morbidity on account of Hep B and uh, Hep C. Now, it has all the components. So, one 
important component was about the prevention part of it, which is in terms of, uh, not only in terms of ensuring the birth dose of hepatitis, but particularly in those districts where we have uh, low institutional deliveries, we are making sure that part of the ANC itself, we are testing pregnant women for uh, presence of hepatitis B. And uh, also, I mean, uh, under the, um, besides then you have blood transfusion, blood safety, injection safety, etc. A whole, whole lot of measures are simultaneously uh, being taken. Like we have decided that it's only the reuse, uh, this thing, injection that would be now reuse uh, put. Yeah, reuse prevention. Uh, injection uh, syringes would be now put to use. In terms of uh, diagnosis and treatment, both for Hep B and Hep C are going to be available absolutely free of cost. Now, to begin with, they are going to be available absolutely free of cost in public health facilities. But we also propose to rope in the private sector just in a way we are doing it for tuberculosis where the diagnosis and treatment of patients even going to the private sector would be provided free of cost under the National Viral Hepatitis Control Program. We also have to have a whole program in terms of creating awareness generation, trying to prevent stigma and all. And these programs like empathy and all extremely useful. Then you have to have a good robust MIS system and also good registry and all that. So it's a very well thought out program. We have created all the detailed operational guidelines, both in terms of diagnostic protocols, treatment protocols, etc. And I'm very happy that uh, Almost across all our states and UTs, we have been able to create at least one uh, model treatment and diagnosis center. Most of the states have done it or are going to be doing it within a fortnight from now. So we are on the path and I'm sure within a year from now, you will see that uh, this National Viral Hepatitis Pro Control Program will have its presence right from primary health care facility up to our tertiary care facilities involving both the public and private sector. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Um, Dr. Seema, um, you've heard um, Dr. Paul say that it needs to be, viral hepatitis needs to become part of a primary health care framework. And we heard from Mr. Jalani how the plan today is now to move it into a, a, a scale up where free diagnosis and then subsequent treatment will be available, um, scaled up through the private public and then the private sectors. From your experience, both in terms of looking at where institutional deliveries are taking place, where the babies are happening, do you see um, this movement taking place where not just the public sector but also the private sector practitioners and healthcare facilities are actually becoming more cognizant of their role to prevent and manage uh, hepatitis B transmissions and also the treatments? So I learned from Dr. Anjalani's uh, document for WHO, uh, you know, uh, for Hepatitis India, that uh, the in December 2017, of all the institutional deliveries, 79% were only uh, received the birth dose. So now this is something that I think should be the first goal, and which I feel that even that document, uh, you know, a kind of. Uh, says that they will be, this will be the first goal. And I think the way that you can go forward and bring that goal closer to home is, I, I think each and every delivery in an institution is attended. Whether it's attended by a nurse, if it's a normal delivery, or it's attended by a doctor, if it's a, a you know, a, a, you know a, a cesarean section. So I feel that small tray that goes there inside for the baby, uh, for babies cleaning up or for the baby's uh, resuscitation. I think now uh, hepatitis B vaccine uh, pre-filled syringe could just be part of that tray and it goes inside. I, either it's given there and then or it could be given the minute the baby is brought out and cleaned up in the, in the nursery area. So either of these, and, I, and, and apart from giving these vaccine in this way, there's one more thing which I feel we should, that area we should make use of, is that we have a captive audience of a, ba of a mother who comes to us for the antenatal checkups. There we should talk to her about this. Where they, where, while she's waiting for the delivery, the family, we should talk to, talk to them about it there and then. And maybe a little bit of incentives for the healthcare workers may just bring about this change. I, I, I'm just set thinking as a pediatrician. 
with Dr. Paul on, the, on my side, I think I'm too small to talk about it. I, I, I heard uh, Mr. Jalani say that it's part of the tray. What was part of the tray, sir? Yeah. The, the pre-filled syringes for hepatitis B vaccination is part of the guidelines, so it's there. And so there is really no reason why any child should be left unimmunized in the first 24 hours before, after birth. Right, thank you so much for that. If I may then turn to the example of a city or a city state that actually led off in trying to address viral hepatitis. It's, it's nearly 20 years ago that, that Delhi began doing something about it. Where has that journey uh, taken the city of Delhi? I like you, right? Like you rightly mentioned, um, Delhi was the pioneer. It started the uh, hepatitis uh, Delhi for de uh, day in Delhi in 99. And thereafter, the journey has been uh, led by Dr. Sareen. And uh, Delhi was also the first state which started immunization for hepatitis B in 2001. And uh, given the seriousness of this um, whole issue... Sir, could you hold the mic closer? Yes. Given the seriousness of the whole issue, Delhi was the first uh, city, of a, probably the first state which set up the ILBS to look at the issue holistically. And uh, it's the tertiary care hospital that was set up in that year. And ILBS has been a pioneer over the past many years. And we have been carrying out trainings to um, Project Prakash for various uh, medical colleges. We also trained all of our healthcare workers on the, uh, on the issue of hepatitis B and C. We are also trained all of our district doctors. And uh, as you would know, in Delhi, the Aam Admi Mohalla clinics have been set up where the, uh, where the testing for serology, the first test, is being done at the Mohalla uh, clinic levels besides being done at the dispensaries and hospitals. And, um, uh, we have also got a, uh, have at GB Panth and at ILBS, we have the secondary level testing which takes place to um, uh, find out the viral load and then the treatment starts. Earlier we were doing it only for the IPD patients but after the uh, launch day before yesterday, uh, we will be testing all the OPD uh, 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 patients who come, for, come to the OPD also. And uh, we are committed to the target of eradicating this disease, hepatitis uh, B and C by 2020. So, so Delhi has the advantage. Sorry. So Delhi has the advantage both of starting early and then eminent personalities like Dr. Sareen and institutions like ILBS come along. Delhi is not short on capacity for managing um, complications or progressions of the disease. And, and I'm turning to you, um, Dr. Saraya. I mean, you have a apex institution, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, also sitting here. And then you see the full spectrum. You see, you have babies being born, and at the other end you have the um, late stage um, progressions of the disease also come through to you. How do you see the, uh, the picture as far as Delhi is concerned, given that there's been two decades of work already being done and you've been sitting as an apex institution and you've had people like Dr. Paul also kind of see yes, this yes. whole conversation going through? Okay. In fact, uh, you have posed this question saying that we are sitting in an apex institution. Our trinity of mission is to to train students, number one, to develop new modules of teaching, then to provide quality care to the poorest of the poor, and third, to carry out research in the national interest. So, as you have already said, that uh, the, our mandate is different, and we are basically not a hospital, but a university. So, as far as... Uh, uh, controlling or contributing in the research in the field of hepatitis is concerned, we will definitely like to sensitize our resident student on these issues. In fact, public health issue has already been discussed in the previous session and uh, probably uh, other people will also discuss. And secondly, uh, being in a tertiary referral center, so patients are generally referred to us with complications of hepatitis B and C at an advanced stage. So our role is to provide care and to try to control the complications or delay the complications to the extent possible. And third thing is that, as you have said, that we are trying to uh, develop uh, diagnostics, then probably in a poor country like India, where people's ability to pay is less, we have to go for for diagnostics which is cheap and easily available. Because you see here, 
Unfortunately, out-of-pocket expenditure on health is of the tune of more than 70 percent, and roughly 50 to 40 percent people are living below poverty line or pushed below poverty line due to out-of-pocket expenditure. In such a scenario, if we are discussing uh, the schemes which government is launching, I have my own reservations. Why I say so? That government is now becoming purchaser of healthcare instead of being guarantor of healthcare. We are depending on private sector to provide, which in my opinion is not a correct um, a policy. Right, and, and, and I'll hold that thought for a second and I'll come back to you, Mr. Jalani, about that um, statement that he's made. But let me turn to you, Dr. Hank. Um, the, your last posting before you came to one-sixth of humanity was in a country called Egypt. Population? A hundred million, which is about our state of Maharashtra. And yet, it, this was a country with a rampant hepatitis C issue. Um, with what? Percentage of the population um, that was affected? About? In my age group, 25%. 25% of the population no, 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 of, the, of the age group. And I'm going to kind of hand it over to you. And yet, one of the world's largest elimination efforts took place. And you were responsible um, to oversee some of that. How does that square, that effort square with the efforts that have been done in Delhi so far and what is it that both a smaller state or the entire country can learn from what has happened there? Thank you very much. First of all, it's very, I'm very glad to be over here on the eve of World Hepatitis Day. And just also like to make the point what others have already been making, hepatitis is finally on the agenda. It has taken a little bit long, globally. The figures were always there. If you look at the figures, they should have been there far much earlier, especially in Asia. But so happy that there's now attention for it. That's the first thing. I indeed, I was working in Egypt, and 25% of my age group was hepatitis C positive. It had to do with uh, uh, the cystosomiasis uh, treatment that time was, was done by injections, and it was not done well, and 25% of a certain part of the population being positive, it meant that every family was affected. So it was very high on the awareness and, the polit and, and on the political part. Now, a few things which are very important. Let's also just look at a few things that has happened recently. It was only in 2013, 2014, that a medicine became available that can cure hepatitis C. Before there was treatment, but the percentage of of Q was around 50 percent. That, that drug was in 2014 and it's still, in, uh, the, uh, as of now, in America it is about $80,000 for one course of three months. It's in Europe about 40000 It's in, in, in Egypt, and we were at that time with the, the World Health Organization together with the Egypt authorities, we were able to get it down to a price of 900 but guess what? Do you know what the price here now is in India? For the treatment of hepatitis C. It's around $40. Can you imagine from $80,000 you go to $40? Now this is extremely important. And that's also what WHO stands for. And we're very proud of India. It, this means that now the treatments can be accessible and it is affordable. So we, we would like to put a big applause for India to make this affordable for the people in India, but I think globally there also is a big effect. Now, so that's one of the major lessons what I think we, what, what I took from India. And I, again, some of us have been in public health for quite some time. When HIV AIDS treatment became available, the first five years we were not thinking about that Africa could afford it. We have not made the mistake by hepatitis. By hepatitis, from the beginning, when we knew there was a treatment to cure people, it should be made accessible for everyone. So that's one area. The other part, which I think from uh, Egypt, uh, what I very clearly took is the part that if you're going to treat patients, you need to follow them very carefully. Three months treatment, you have to make sure that they can finish the treatment. The patients start with the virus, and actually what we have learned what you need to do, at the end of the treatment, you need to test them again and see if the virus is still there. So having a database and making sure that the patient is taking the whole treatment and that you know at the end if the patient is cured is extremely important. I'm again very proud of India. The part what India, what India is now doing, that's what is going to be happening. 
anybody will get on treatment will be part of the database and will also be followed up. So in Punjab, where the most of the patients at this time have been treated, the cure rate is 92%. That is exactly what you expected, is between the 90 and 95%. But at least, and I will be very honest with you, in India we know the figure. Where I came from in Egypt, they know only from a quarter of the patients, or perhaps half, but the other half they don't know. So again, congratulations was on the other lessons. The other part is very important. I st when I was in Egypt, they started one year before I came to um, India. After one year of treatment, they didn't know where the patients were. The first patients who were aware of it, they came forward. But then the clinicians came to me and said, Hank, actually we have a difficulty. We know that there are at least another four or five million in Egypt who have the disease, but we don't know where they are. And this is something that's very important, but also the team of today. It is a silent disease. I think you have most likely listened to Amitabh Bachchan. He tells you, if you have only a quarter of your liver functioning, you function normal. So people don't even know that the liver is being attacked. Sure. So this is one of the, this, this, these are some of the issues which I think are very important. That therefore awareness and the testing is one other part. So, I have a few more. Yeah, yeah, so, so let's hold it. I'll, I'll come back. There's enough time on this panel. Um, so, Dr. Shabnam, um, if, if the if the continuum is people to be aware, then they move to a place where they are either getting an immunization or they are diagnosed. They are starting off on a treatment, they need to be followed through and to a demonstrated cure or to a demonstrated level of a viral suppression, it requires a lot of people. And we can't put doctors like Dr. Saraya or the specialists like Dr. Seema or Professor uh, Paul everywhere. It requires a whole bunch of people at varying levels of the healthcare system and below. You're chair of the Health Sector Council. How do we get so many people in to support the ambitions of the National Viral Hepatitis uh, Program itself? Um, so, Wabi, uh, I've been listening to the panels as well as the discussion here. It's precisely for this in 2008 we envisaged and we put the Health Sector Skill Council together. It was from two perspectives. One, no matter what happens, the, the rate and speed at which we in India need medical professionals and the traditional way of training, those two, the twain were never going to meet, number one. Number two, the disease processes, the pandemics, the epidemics, they were evolving so fast that people were needed here and now. And the people were not only hardcore clinical people, but there was a whole bunch of non-clinical people required both in the public and the private sector. That gave birth to the Health Sector Skill Council. While we put this together to train people as what I put at a sliver at the bottom of the pyramid, which is a person who is a person, we have taken that and said that we will train them. The second challenge is that we will train them. We will train them. Where will these people come from? When we started seeing student mobilization was a huge challenge. Koi bhi bacha ya koi bhi vyakti ye nahi chahta hai ki wo urine or stool chue. Jaha usko pata chala ki jo meri training mil rahi hai, wo doctor banne ke chalte wo urine stool chhu lega, khun chhu lega. But jaha wo dekhega ki na mein doctor, na mein nurse. Mein sirf ek assistant hoon aur aap kehre mein uska urine stool. I'll translate it a little later. I... वो कहता है नहीं मेरे को काम नहीं करना है अगेन ह्यूज चैलेंज अब इसको कैसे करें देन वी केम अपॉन दिस पॉइंट दे विल बी बी एबल टू सॉल्व फॉर टू बिग प्रॉब्लम्स नंबर वन हाउ डू यू एंगेज कम्युनिटी आप किस प्रकार से सब पूरे देश में कैसे फैल सकते हो कैसे आप लोगों का सोच विचार चेंज कर सकते हो तो हम लोगों ने ट्रेनिंग शुरू करी स्कूल्स में Nine standard, so like a tak, till you graduate, we introduced a program which is called the general duty assistant. So the child graduates from school with a certificate of general duty assistant, where agar uski arthik sthiti ye hai, he's not economically strong, he can go immediately and get employed. We started, the pilot started in Himachal. Touchwood today, this program is now in 17 states. 17 states. 
These children are about two and a half, three lakh. Our concept was, aap ek bacche ko padhayenge, aap ek pura parivar ko padhayenge. You, 90% of the problem in our country is, we don't know Jhilani sahab raat din laga ke kaam kar rahe hain. Aap raat din laga ke kaam kar rahe hain sir, niti ayog mein. But jo aadmi ko wo awareness hai ki ye mere ko free mil raha hai, usko kuch nahi maaloom hai. More importantly, they are only dependent upon the male member in the house to be able to access it. So here by telling the child about public health activities, that child is influencing the whole family. Fair enough. So, I mean, I, I want to flip to Dr. Paul. I mean, she's mentioned about the health sector council and, and trying to create a whole auxiliary workforce or, 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 or a level that is um, closer to the patient or the point of care. You're in this smack in the middle of this whole conversation about where we have a national med medical council or a national medical revamp that's going on in the training. How is it kind of synchronized with the care needs? Let's take it from the lens of hepatitis to the training needs of the earlier panel, there was a conversation that the MBBS needs to be better sensitized or better trained to the tertiary ends. How do we kind of telescope this entire training so that we are addressing things like hepatitis right from the bottom levels to the tertiary care levels too? So two aspects. One is that now that these, uh, the paradigm uh, for addressing hepatitis diseases has changed and that has happened more recently. There is a need for us to make sure that a primary care physician should be able to, with confidence, able to do it. So that there is no dependence on moving to a faraway secondary system and beyond. It should be possible for a doctor to have that much of confidence that if I get this, I, can, I, I know what needs to be done and as much as possible create a setup to be able to treat because the number that we're dealing with cannot be tackled only at a at a secondary level system. Second aspect is to train our, and educate our doctors through a continuing medical education because that confidence to use new drugs, costly drugs in this manner for a disease of this nature which was not taught a few years ago optimally I think is another issue. But the second dimension to this whole discourse is how we can leverage. It's about awareness. We are talking about talk, test and treat strategy. How can we leverage the primary healthcare system, the emerging Ayushman Bharat Health and Wellness Center approach that this nation has taken to connect to that need. So I would say these are the two ends for the first part in the council and training system. If there are any suggestions, if you spot these competencies are missing, please let us know. Join hands with us. We will take care of it. And also mount continuing, continuing medical education along with other partners. At the same time, let's create a model where public awareness and to get individuals to come, to get tested and treated eventually, is also addressed through the primary healthcare system as well as through the urban, corresponding urban system. So I would act on these two. So points. if I may then turn to you, Mr. Jalani. Assuming that the Health Sector Council and uh, through the um, reinvigorated way that we are going to think about medical education and training, do you anticipate that this national viral hepatitis plan would accelerate itself to a point where we can dream of elimination of both um, hepatitis B and hepatitis C in this country? What do, you, what do you think about it? Is that something that either keeps you awake worrying or is that something that encourages you when you wake up? Well, uh, the letter. <laughs> the letter, okay. It encourages you when you wake up. Let's hear why. Uh, now, in terms of the issue of this National Viral Hepatitis Control Program going right up to the primary health care level where the health and wellness centers itself take care of uh, treatment part of it. Now, if you look at uh, the entire operational guidelines, I mean, that is the essential direction in which we would be moving where essentially, I mean, you know, so even for this for the hepatitis C uh, treatment for uh, 84 days. So the follow-up and the treatment will essentially be happening right at the primary care level. Now the issue of this continuing medical education that Dr. Paul rightly raised, you know, in our health and wellness centers, there are two elements to it. Each of our health and wellness centers will have 
a teleconsultation facility. Two, we are also trying to leverage this ECHO platform which facilitates peer-to-peer -peer learning. So this, we used ECHO uh, during the treatment of hepatitis C cases in case of Punjab and now, so each of these people at the PHCs or the community health officers at our sub-center level health and wellness centers will have that mechanism of ECHO platform to continuously be uh, educated, trained and they would be presenting cases and there will be a person at the hub who will continue to build in their capacities. So that's essentially the direction. I'm absolutely certain that our direction is right. Country is huge. Challenges are huge. Complexities are there. Governance issues are there. The whole lot of logistical challenges are there. Capacity issues are there. But, and it's a new program. So we need to realize that. But I'm sure uh, in a very short period of time, we will have our things uh, in place right up to the PHCs. Uh, the other part of it in terms of creating awareness, trying to destigmatize the disease, trying to make sure that people should want to come forward, get themselves tested, get themselves detected, seek treatment, that's another part which is another challenge. Thank so, you. So, Mr. Jalani has got 1.35 billion people to think about. You've got a much lesser number. Um, he has to kind of think about the complexities of the system and the governance and things like that. You've got it at a much smaller scale here in Delhi. You've also got a head start. They've got, I mean, the national program is only about a year old. You started off some 20 years ago. Is it about time to think that Delhi might be the first of the states to eliminate um, hepatitis? Um, that will be our aim and our target. That will be a... Do you want to put a timeline to it? It's a, it's a challenge it? we want to take on. Yes. And uh, we have a system in place where we have a kind of a very widespread kind of network of these Mohalla clinics which can be used for counselling and also right now testing and detection is being done in these places, the primary part of it. So we would love to take up this challenge and be the, one of the first states in the country to do it. So again, I mean, cross-state learnings, I mean, is there something that, I mean, there's been a mention of Punjab and the way that um, they've been able to both not only pick up people but track the treatment uh, pro course through up to 92% of the people are, are tagged and known as to where their treatment course has ended up with. Isn't that a little bit, isn't that something that could be adapted or even improved on in a smaller place like Delhi? We will uh, take learnings from Punjab. And in Delhi, we have a huge problem of migratory population. Of migrant populations, and yes. And we always have this issue of how to treat them because a lot of people, they come for our uh, other programs also. They take some initial treatments and then leave. But we have told our people that we need to track this, uh, we need to keep mobile numbers and the MIA system that has been developed. And somehow uh, track all the people who have come to you once to continue the treatment with us. Because if you uh, break the treatment, then uh, again the, the viral loads and other things increase. So we, we want to ensure that somehow these people they stay with us for three months. Right. So, and so, so you've got this issue that people may turn up to you, but they may not necessarily stay with you to be able, for you to be able to track them through their either viral conversion or things like that. Um, two, two quick comments, one from Hank and then um, Dr. Seema. If I complete, because it's just about the children, I just want to bring it to the notice of the De Delhi government that they haven't as yet allowed the child children to be treated for HCV with the, with the direct acting uh, antivirals. And now there is data coming up that they're safe, their safety profile, and they're very effective. So if you have a family where there is an adult being treated and a child not being treated, you are actually coming back to the same square one. So I think we need to look at that. I think a few, a few things, if you don't mind, about the elimination part. If you look at elimination of diseases, there are a few things which are very common. And, and a few things I would just like to mention. Some things are in place at this very moment, certain other things need perhaps to be strengthened. Surveillance. If you don't strengthen your surveillance, you will be unable to eliminate because you need to know your numbers, you need to know where they are. I'm very encouraged that I understand that uh, that is now being planned to do both surveillance uh, in the future, but also looking back at some of the blood samples that which are already there, which is extremely important. The other part is important, what you already mentioned, community. There is no disease in the world that has been eliminated without the, the participation of communities. So it's very important, and that's also linked to the whole awareness component. But the other part we should not forget, prevention is the best. 
and certain things are already there, but we need to continue improving the hepatitis B immunization. Like you already said, from if you're in the immunization part, the period that the mother can infect the child is the first 24 hours. This is indeed or becomes a priority program of the ministry. I think a mission under the NUSH will also be picked up, but it's extremely important. This is the part period is very important. Blood safety. We need to make sure that we, the blood is continued being safe, that we need to move towards more voluntary blood donations. Then the reuse prevention. Perhaps you realize in a country like India, you have about 4 billion injections in a year. In some countries did a study and they looked at it and how many of these injections are safe. And in the country where I came from, Egypt, they said about 7 to 8 percent is not safe. Now 7 to 8 percent of 8 billion is a lot. And one way of making it more safe is start using the reuse prevention syringes, which is now being also introduced by the government in the public sector. But I honestly think that we should be aiming in one or two years that it should not only be for the public sector, but it should also be done in the private sector. Also, some details about medical devices. In some countries, and India is not the only country, medical devices are being reused. If you're going to do that, you need to be very sure that you clean them properly. So these are some issues which I need to mention. Also, the Swas Bharat is a very important part for the hepatitis uh, A and E, uh, that we also need to look at that one as a prevention method. Which then brings me to a question of convergence or even um, getting more bang for the buck. Um, much of the transmission patterns for hepatitis, apart from the um, vaccine preventable aspect of it, overlaps fairly with the HIV control program too. And so a lot of the work that we've done over the last 25, 30 years on blood safety, on injection safety, on, on making sure that there is um, uh, safe workspace environments and stuff like that, hasn't really dented the hepatitis B, C transmission trajectories. And so therefore, is it about time to also talk about them together? Uh, Mr. Jalani, um, any thoughts on that? No, you're absolutely right. So the NVHCP builds on, I mean, a whole lot of convergence. So one kind of convergence, you rightly said, is about the NACO program where uh, you have because blood safety is primarily there. populations and all that. And uh, so uh, there is, we, I mean, all the elements that would help in terms of preventing spread of HIV AIDS are also the interventions which are, would be helpful for Hep B uh, and C. Now, besides, so, I mean, in terms of convergence, so you have, I mean, for if you take uh, viral hepatitis A and all that, then Swachya Bharat Abhiyan. So there are convergence in terms of immunization program, NACO, Swachya Bharat Abhiyan. Then we have all this, I mean, blood safety and injection safety uh, that you talked about and a whole lot of hygiene and other programs. So, menstrual hygiene program. So, I, I'm sure with all the actions simultaneously happening, we, we should be able to make an accelerated progress. So, before I come to Dr. Shabnam, I mean, I know that she has a, a comment to make. I just want to turn to the two specialties, uh, specialists here. Dr. Jal Mr. Jalani has talked about convergences and here's another place where we haven't heard anything being talked about. Long-term progression of Hep B or C diseases will get us a significant burden or proportion of liver cancers. And, and that's a certain, certain morbidity and mortality that is entirely avoidable, preventable, provided we had picked it up earlier by prevention or by picking them up early in disease course, diagnosing them early and putting them on viral suppression treatment or complete treatments with the AAs. Um, where are we on that uh, and where is that conversation taking place? Because if you take away liver cancers, you're roughly about 30% down from the total burden of disease on that spectrum. Okay, if you ask me uh, the childhood hepatitis B, see hepatitis C is not that common in children, so I will leave that around. It's, yes. the, it's B that I'm going to be talking about. So if you talk about hepatitis B in children and its conversion to cirrhosis as well as HCC later on, so um, in various phases of hepatitis B infection between 10 to 15 percent, maximum 15 percent can go and become cirrhosis and eventually even HCC. So that, that is where the, uh, the whole crux of the situation lies that you treat a babe child with hepatitis or you prevent the infection of hepatitis B, you actually save money on that adult who 
goes in and out of the hospital like we were discussing in the earlier sessions so a neonatal prevention of hepatitis Just is a actually 500 worth 500 rupees worth vaccine can make you save 5 lakh rupees later over a lifetime and, and maybe a transplant of 20 lakhs and a lakhs. transplant or or a mortality there same thing for hepatitis c2 sir again you see very small percentage of patients with hepatitis c will ultimately develop hep, 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 hcc or that is hepatic cellular carcinoma in fact i'll i'll say one thing more what uh, she was saying that hepatitis b if acquired through mother there are more chances that you may not be able to clear it because there is uh, there is integration of that you know then second thing which is very important is that the risk of hepatitis uh, b related hcc that is hepatic cellular carcinoma will not uh, uh, be less even after clearance clearance in hepatitis b is very difficult because it survive it has two mechanism by which it can survive in in the cell uh, it forms there are ccc dna it's a technical term i am telling so virus can survive through that it keeps on multiplying one thing i would like to say that she is saying that we can give one shot of vaccine and we can prevent many things i have as i have said in uh, you see that type of political will has to be there if we really want to control because if you want to give vaccine to everyone those who who are entitled for that then we cannot rely on private sector to produce government has to produce these vaccines in their own setup number 1 because there are at least as far as i remember dr dr paul may be knowing that 20 more than 20 units those who are producing vaccines we have shut down and the cost of vaccine will go down like anything if government produce in its own setup because the whole genome is known and there is and the whole thing is off patent now so the cost of production will be less and you will be able to implement this program in a much better way number 2 i i have my own reservation on one thing more in any country where we are not been able to reach more than 80% of the target population herd is not going to change and as we have seen that even with institutionalized deliveries we are not been able to reach to that extent as far as vaccination is concerned till 15 it was only 45% it is little more now the last word to you ma'am uh, so this is a um, uh, offer to dr sari to mr janani dr paul and i can see ma'am priti sudan is also here from cii we are working uh, in the private sector to build awareness of all the public health programs for tuberculosis we'd be very happy to take it to all our member 10000 companies to start building the awareness among all the workers because engaging community to our mind is the best way a to bring them in encourage them and ensure prevention actually happens at the end of the day prevention is better than cure uh, thank you dr shabnam it's been 44 minutes of our conversation and then i'm grateful to each one of you for dipping into your experience to um, enable us to understand the opportunity that we as one sixth of humanity have today to address something that was still very recently very very silent we didn't even talk about it till about say 12 2010 12 or even 13 and today now we have got a national plan and we are even beginning to dare to talk about use the word elimination and that's that significantly um encouraging that we are able to talk that way we are able because we have the tools in place we have the offers of um expanding the workforce and we also have the ways in which we are recasting our system so that we are providing a greater impetus for picking up people much earlier and i hope that perhaps delhi or maybe punjab or one of our 35 units would be able to put up the flag first and say we have eliminated it thank you so much for being part of this panel it's been such a privilege to have you talk with each one of us thank you very much ma'am